I've got a quick question, Alex, if I may. Yep. Go for it. Yep. So to Adam Lewis speaking here, I, I'll kick off with a question to, to Caitlin. I, I noticed you talked that this latest development from CSIRO, probably perhaps this goes to Rob, is around supporting ZAR formats. And they seem to be a pretty sophisticated format that's coming out of the ocean science community. And um, uh, it's kind of heartening to see that. And I'm just wondering if there are any roadblocks for seeing in that uh, or, or whether it's and how well advanced it is in terms of the ability to support those. Yeah, I think um, Rob might be well placed to to take that question. Okay, thanks. Um, so yeah, Peter Wang's been working very hard on this with a with a small team. Uh, the ZAR format. Uh, the the primary differentiator with the with the ZAR format is it is that multi dimensional nature nature of it. Um, ODC makes very heavy use of X ray. Um, and the associated DASC uh, componentry that goes with that. Um, and ZAR for, supports the full um, X-ray multidimensional um, storage format. Um, the Open Data Cube's storage API um, doesn't meet that full um, flexibility. It doesn't have a, a sense of N dimensions in it. It has a, an Earth observation um, flavor and semantic to it, um, which creates a bit of a, a, a small, I'll call it a small incompatibility um, in, in the nature of, of how you can combine data and how you can combine that uh, efficiently when you're dealing with the additional uh, dimensionality. And this, this manifests itself in how the chunking occurs, uh, which is important for performance in, in the distributed computing environments um, using DASC and so forth. So we had the prototype does in fact contain um, a slightly simplified version of, of the ZAR model. It reads ZAR quite happily, but it, it, it's more conformant with the existing um, COG style format. So it has the same limitations on dimensionality uh, and that's implemented and that works uh, quite effectively. Um, the additional changes to get the additional dimensionality um, and CSIRO would very much like to see this happen um, is likely a breaking change to the storage API in Open Data Queue. Um, so it's not a not a change we want to take lightly um, uh, at all because of the way in which uh, we've got the whole stack API kicking in, which has similar um, semantics around Earth observation as opposed to the climate models. So we're, we're currently still navigating that path, um, yeah. and we do have a prototype, um, and it is it is working, and it does show performance improvements. Um, but we're going to have to do that carefully so as not to 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 uh, uh, upset the apple cart and all the other things you can do. It shouldn't do because it literally is a superset of capability um, compared to what you see in the normal system. But it does mean that the nature of the API needs to tweak a little bit. Great, thanks, Rob. And we, um, I believe, we've merged in the first pull request for that, so we can so you can say that the open data you support ZAR, although it's a reading slice by slice uh, type support rather than reading um, big three D chunks. Um, I have a question quickly for Sachin. Um, what is um, what do you see as the biggest limiting factor or risk or the hardest part? What is the wicked problem of the um, Digital Earth Pacific? Well, like I saw in my few slides, uh, the lack of uh, useful data because of cloud cover and also lack of coverage. So, for example, uh, for RMI, we don't have any capture for central one data across the whole year. So we have to look at other sources such as LOS and whatnot. So uh, readily usable open data uh, is not uh, an easy thing for us. Yeah. Got it, I see. Yeah. I have a follow-up question for the multi-dimensional data set. Uh, if we do, if ODC does support ZAR, does that mean that we'll be able to support NetCDF and consume uh, Sentinel-3 data sets going forward in the future? Is that the general idea? Where does NetCDF fit in? Uh, so NetCDF is slightly more complicated because NetCDF's format itself, whilst it's conceptually similar in multi-dimensions, NetCDF format directly is not really accessible very well from the cloud as a format. It's great from file systems. It's uh, in its native form, appalling in cloud is the only way to put it. Um, however, there is a lot of work being done on the NetCDF API um, to provide what effectively is a ZAR backend. <laughs> so a NetCDF for cloud native. And there's also a couple of other uh, more cachey servery mechanisms that are being developed. Um, so 
we can anticipate that that would happen in future. If that does f fully mature and somebody wants to, then you could use the same technique we're using with Zar to read NetCDF straight in. Um, we, we do climate modeling with Earth observation data in CSIRO, so we have the same problem. We want both. <laughs> so I'm going to, um, I'm trying not to throw my opinions in here, but I do have an opinion here in that um, Sentinel 3 data, I believe, is NetCDF is extremely flexible and Sentinel 3 data is, is like a, it's like a um, relational database. And so it's it's not standard at all either. So even if you could read it from the cloud, it's it's not going to be performant or simple to read. Um, we have a question from Richard Scott, which is speaking as someone who is a database programmer, managing database servers is not fun. Do you have a ballpark guess on the load from stack capability timeframe? So we're working with, or I'm working with, um, uh, folks from Element 84, so Matt Hansen, uh, who's got a lot of experience with uh, Stack and Stack API, and we are hoping to get something working, the minimum viable product, by um, by Phosphor G. So that's um, uh, late August, I think, is is our goal. And um, but we know we know what we want to do to put in place to make it happen. So it should be. Um, I'm hoping it'll be pretty soon. Making that something that's um, production ready, uh, probably needs a whole bunch of polish and uh, enhancements to make the user experience uh, great, but yeah, it's going to move. Uh, I have another question here from Barrett Moore. Uh, could you elaborate on the product that was shown in the first presentation on water availability that is being constantly updated? Could you outline the methodology that is being used and what data is based on when it came live and how open is when it came, when can it live and how open is the government to the use of remote sensing? Okay, I'm not sure that I understand that final bit, but uh, Claire, do you want to? Yeah, um... yeah, I'm happy to jump on that one. So um, I didn't go into too much detail about the product itself because of the form we're in, but I'm, there's a publication that was recently put out that goes through the methodology in detail. So I'll put the link in the chat for that if you want to follow up. But the short version is um, we're using the Landsat data set to generate that data set. Um, and it's using the water observations from space water classifier to identify the locations of water. So basically we mapped the locations of water within a within a water body. And then every time the Landsat archive goes over, sorry, the Landsat, every time Landsat flies overhead, we use the water classifier to look inside that outline that we've defined to work out what the change in surface area of water is over time. So the question is around how open was the government to using it? So it was actually developed in collaboration with the uh, with the state government, so the the level just below federal. So in Australia, we have three levels of government. Um, we Geoscience Australia and CSIRO sit at the federal level. The state governments manage a bit more detailed stuff. So um, we we're working with the states at that point, and we actually developed this product to prove that we can use remote sensing data to make decisions. Um, and so the way that we uh, we went about that was we did. The, the easiest, smallest thing that we could possibly show them using remote sensing data. And basically it was duplicating some of the work that they'd already been doing, but using the Open Data Cube um, and Landsat. And they kind of got on board with that. And then from that point, we've slowly improved and built upon our capability to the point that we now have this product that's updating regularly. Every time there's a Landsat um, overpass, it updates the amount of water inside each of those water bodies. So we did, um, we did do a bunch of work to try and build trust in that product and it's now been quite well regarded. There's still some skepticism. Um, the main issue being that we're using satellite data so you get a two dimensional picture, not a three dimensional picture. So missing that volume component is a huge limitation. Um, but we're actually actively working on that to incorporate LiDAR data to generate that third dimension so we can work out the relationship between the surface area and the volume. Um, it was um, prototyped in uh, a couple of years ago, it's been live and updating for at least the last 12 months. Um, so I'll, I'll put some links in the chat so you can follow up if you're interested. Um, thanks for the question. Thanks, Claire. Uh, we have another question in here from a new user and I might see if I can pass this to Adam. So what would you, how would you differentiate the Open Data Cube and Google Earth Engine, Adam? I'm not sure I'm really the best person to answer that, Alex, and I might even throw it back to you. Um, <laughs> would, would someone else uh, want to have a, have a go at tackling that? 
Um, I can have a go. Um, I think it'll probably need to be supplemented by a few others on the panel as well. So feel free to interject as I go. But I think um, like you uh, highlighted in, in your question, um, it is an open source uh, implementation. And I guess what that means is that you have a lot more control over how you implement it and how you use it and what data goes into it. And that theoretically means that um, if you can set up the data appropriately, um, you could also bring your own you know, data sets into that and easily integrate them. Um, there are differences in how the data is handled in terms of how it's presented to you and lots of capability for um, you know, analyzing lots of different data sets together in terms of being able to bring the data in and have all the spatial metadata associated with it so that you can do um, reprojection and resampling uh, in sort of an easy way and then building it into Python rather than um, Google Earth's engine's JavaScript. So that might mean that once you can load in your Earth observation data, if you can get it into a more standard you know, you can select what you need, but for something like machine learning, um, you often will want to use a simple array structure with lots of normal um, Python packages that are out there for machine learning. So you can take the data directly in a Python environment and more easily manipulate it to feed into those really standard libraries. Um, so I would say those are the main differences. I think there's also a comment in the chat that says, you know, adding new data sets to the open data cube is really frustrating. Um, I would completely agree with you. And I think that what Alex, you know, is sort of talking about with us moving towards um, looking at this stack API option where you're just describing the location of the data in sort of standardized, relatively straightforward, you know, JSON metadata structures would um, mean that doing that indexing processes, which is what you're highlighting of the getting data into the data cube. Like it's all well and good to use other people's data cubes, but getting data into your data cube can, you know, we acknowledge it's, it's pretty challenging. So I really am optimistic that this work will mean that you, you know, one, you'll be able to do that more easily for your own data, but two, you won't have to do it for the really big standard data sets like Sentinel-2 and Landsat. You won't have to go and download the scenes that are relevant to you and index them into your own database and all of these things um, that we've needed to do in the past. So I think that that'll make a really big difference. That's right. I think I, I agree with everything that you've said there, Caitlin. I think Something that I that the really simple difference between the Google Earth Engine and Open Data Cube. Step back there is that Google Earth Engine is a platform as a service, and as long as you work within the within the design of that platform, then that's fine. But if you want to do something that it doesn't support, then it starts getting hard to to influence it. Uh, also, the license in Google Earth Engine is uh, complicated in that if you want to build a commercial application on top of it, it's possible, but you need to start negotiating with a with a local company to, um, to to negotiate with Google in order to get a license in order to commercialize. So I think it's a, um, so, so the Open Data Cube certainly has a steeper learning curve, It's but you are empowered to own and control the entirety of the platform that you can build with it. Um, Adam's had his hand up for a while, so I might pass over. So just to, augment that, Alex, so, and stepping back, we start, the question started with the user sort of advice from an organizational perspective, something, two things that are very important for digital Earth Africa are countries have to have full transparency over the data, where it's sitting, what happens to it and what's made from it. And that's, that's really important. Uh, and another is that we don't want to have any sort of barrier around private sector exploitation and making profit from the products that might be produced or used. So those are two important things for DE Africa. Yeah. So that's the that's the the open license on the data and the open source license on the software. Yeah. Um, there's a question in the chat from Jonathan who has asked about uh, APIs. Um, so so there's a couple of levels of API here. There's there's the API to access the data. There's an API to access the metadata. There's an API to access the visualization, and the OGC has been great at standardizing some of those APIs and they're in the in the process of modernizing those 
For example, the Stack API is an OGC API it's for features, like a, it's like a vector um, API, like the old WFS. And so these are, these are standard APIs in order to, to, to do certain things. And the Open Data Group has the visualization side of things with the OGC's uh, uh, web mapping service. Uh, the question around analytics, I think, this is a great opportunity to spruik the next live session, which is happening uh, Wednesday evening in Australia time. Uh, uh, it is Wednesday morning, I think, <laughs> US time. It's Tuesday morning, Russian. I've, I've got my time zones mixed up. Um, uh, Wednesday morning, I think, US time. So, uh, so, so anyway, I, I get lost in time. So my point there is that OpenEO is a platform that is being developed that does have an API, a, a generic API into kicking off uh, processing on infrastructure, including the Open Data Cube as a, as a low level uh, library to do that processing. And so I, I encourage you to, to get familiar with OpenEO and to have a look at, listen to Matthias Mauer's presentation um, later in the week. I think it's exactly what you're talking about, Jonathan. Um, other questions coming through in the chat? I might pause and open up to anybody else on the panel. Ben Jolly says, I'm in the middle of acquiring data for an Antarctic open data cube. Should I continue with the EO style metadata descriptions or go straight to stack? So to get a diversity of opinions, Rob, what do you think? What do you use in easy? Uh, we use both. <laughs> um, I think the uh, we, at the moment we we are between things, all right. So as an ODC community, we are between Stack and and EO metadata, and we are indexing. Um, although you can very nearly do without actually indexing in the database if you if you try hard. Um, so we're kind of between things, and uh, and that's going to persist for a little while. So uh, at the moment, the answer is yes. Choose your poison. Uh, <laughs> where possible, we are using for sources of data um, stack metadata, um, which is really good for the analysis ready data that's being put up by people like USGS and um, and uh, and others. Um, so if the if the stack is available, and at this point things like USGS Collection Two, the Element Eighty Four Mirror, um, I've forgotten the name of the other ones. Syn 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 Synergize, um, I'll get it there eventually. Uh, they're starting to produce stack all to a similar quality level to a similar um, uh, mm. level of use. So th those ones you can you can basically use out of the box. There are a bunch of other stacks out there that are different versions. In which case, your stack is a standard, which means there are many of them uh, <laughs> with the same name. Uh, but those ones at least are all are to a pretty similar level, in, due in no small part to the influence of Geoscience Australia globally in that space. Um, so definitely well worth looking at those. Uh, we use a mixture. Our pipeline supports both. Um, and we will transform into EO3 metadata internally anyway. Let's just say you launched a satellite and it was process, you were processing data and storing it somewhere. Would you um, write ODC YAML metadata, stack metadata, or both? If I was operating the satellite? Okay, so well, that's actually a slightly more complicated question. Because there's a huge difference between operating a satellite and storing its results and collection right. management of an ARD system. So, you're managing a, a collection, you were the. If I was managing a collection and I was publishing it, I'd probably go with Stack at the moment, with the associated enhancements required to actually bring it up to to snuff. If you take a really close look, and I'm gonna I'm gonna brag about GA on their behalf here. All right, um, GA do the collection management for, for Australia's archive and that's clearly flown over into Digital Earth um, Africa as well, I might add. They are from my perspective and I'm currently the chair of the Committee on Earth Observations, um, Satellites, Working Group and Information Systems and Services. And they are, to um, by my definition, um, in terms of publishing metadata, one of the gold standard groups all right, they are amongst the best. Uh, they even do things like they tell you the sensors um, actual waveform response. Um, so you can actually do, if you're getting funky about comparing blue sensors and blue sensors, you can actually go through and do the convolutions and corrections to do it. Um, there's a level of detail there that is just fantastic. You can express that with Stack um, if you want to, um, and you can express it with the O3. Some of the other um, available uh, metadata formats don't do that. Um, type of stuff and that can become increasingly important so 
if you want to see the gold standard, take a look at Digital Earth Australia. I'll go with um, for for the kind of metadata you should be publishing. Um, it, it really is good when you can get to that level. Um, but most everything else, there's a minimum baseline, um, and the stack 1.0, I think, is out. Alex will correct me. And look, there's a there's a few extensions that I would say are required for Open Data Cube. We're actually talking about building a meta extension, which says you need to use the project extension, the EO extension, and these fields go from optional to being required, for example. So we want to do that to say that not only is this a stack 1.0 document, but it's a stack 1.0 document that is compatible with the Open Data Cube. So I would say use stack. Um, all right. Any other questions in the chat? I don't see any. Have I missed anything, anybody? Adam's got his hand up again. Yeah, Alex, this is more of a, more of a comment than a question, but I, I think it's really exciting to see people talking about developing um, an open data cube for Antarctica. Um, and it's probably worth, I, I guess if people are thinking about that, it's gonna be interesting to see how it goes um, because I think Antarctica to be credible is going to be need to be more than, it's gonna to need to move beyond the two dimensional we're really about satellite images kind of model to representing three-dimensional and scientific measurements sort of framework of thinking. So it seems to me it's going to push some of these extensions, um, particularly into three-dimensionality, but but also to be really impactful. You're going to need to bring in other measurements that other people are collecting on Antarctica and integrating into a single system. Um, so I think that's going to be a really exciting thing to watch, and there'll be a range of other technical challenges, no doubt. But yeah looking forward to hearing more about it yeah, i can't get over the idea of, of all of the whiteness and being able to get the cloud from the ice and <laughs> how can you analyze that <laughs> um and projection hell and yeah, <laughs> yeah UTM is special <laughs> have fun <laughs> um it's it's a really cool project though uh Juan Montes says, hi, speaking of metadata, I'm sure it will be different with the application, but there are any standards for validation data sets with its corresponding metadata. Anybody on the panel want to tackle that one? Yeah, validation data is a, a really live discussion. I'm not sure there are standards developed, but there are international groups under GEO and GEO GLAM, the Global Agricultural Monitoring Program. We, Digital Earth Africa, are working with them questions around how do you control access, are they all open, who houses them, how do you get to them, are really coming to the fore. So I don't think I have any answers to that, maybe answers out there, but it's going to be a very interesting space to watch. Um, at, with our partners in DE Africa, I think I indicated with them capturing in situ data is, is allowing us to kind of say up front, this will be shared um, uh, in situ and training data. Um, and that leads into the discussion of what happens to those data next. So I, I know that Radiant Earth do some training data and they, they share that data as um, essentially as stack data. Uh, but Claire, do you, do you have any, do you work with much validation data? We get it where we can. And um, unfortunately, most of the validation data we work with has been con has been collected on a very ad hoc kind of basis. So someone five years ago went out into a field, happened to take a measurement that we could find useful. And so we've just grabbed that. Um, the issue with that is it's, it's not standardized. So you do spend quite a bit of time kind of munging it into the format you need to use it. Um, but it also means it's incredibly difficult to find. Um, so you have to know the right person who happened to have been in the right place at the right time to get the right data. So I don't have any good answers to that other than I would totally love for there to be some, um, a, a, a more, um, a, a better way of doing it and collecting it so that it can be used more simply. Um, but so far my experience has been, it's relatively ad hoc. What about you, Caitlin? You, did you work with the um, crop mask validation project? Uh, not, not specifically. So, um, but yeah, certainly I can like agree with Claire that, you know, when you're dealing with ground truth measurements, they can come from all sorts of places and, you know, usually it's on, the analyst to yep. pull them all together and format them the way that you need them. So it's pretty challenging. 
maybe this is an opportunity, Adam. I said you've unmuted, but maybe it's an opportunity for Digital Earth Africa to be sharing that validation data that's been collected. Yeah, so we, we'll be sharing the data, uh, and I think we may be working on a bit of a pe paper around it. The, Chad Burton and uh, Megan Halabiski have been front and center on this, and um, particularly, I mean, Chad's had experience trying to use data from Radiant and other sources uh, to train models and found it to be, there were just too many problems with it and using our regional partners to, and um, Collect Earth Online to collect more training data has been the way we've gone with that. And now the questions, we're just still figuring out exactly how we'll share it, whether it'll be in Radiant looks likely. What the metadata is, is, is yes, has to, there needs to be some sort of standardization yeah. approaches around that. And we're looking to how we, how can you start set a new norm around this that, that can work more widely? Yeah. Great. Uh, we have a question from Andre. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Planning to implement ODC in a state forestry company. Can you give some general suggestions to keep in mind during the setup process? So what about you, Sachin? You're setting up um, a new open data cube. You've set up some small ones in the past. Do you have any advice on how to get started? I mean, uh, I think the first thing to do is uh, do proper planning for infrastructure. So if you are uh, deploying a local instance cube, uh, cube in a box, then you have to know that uh, what is the projected uh, storage space, the computing resources required. Uh, normally, we just deploy the cloud. So we have to do the costing right because, you know, a working organization, we have to get the, the proper procurement processes in place. So I think uh, planning the infrastructure and the, the projected uh, resources required for the possible feature is the key. The second is, uh, of course, indexing in just in data. Uh, so UGSC and uh, Element 84 make it really easy to uh, ingest uh, things like Landsat 8 and Central 2. The challenges you'll face is if you go beyond that uh, for us, which is uh, Central 1. In in a stack format, you're still facing a, a few uh, issues getting the data in and uh, elevation data in. Yeah. So uh, now the recommendation will be to engage closely with the ODC core community, give up the community and get all the help you can get. Yeah. Thanks, Sachin. Can I just add a point to that, that depending on where exactly you're working, um, if there are existing implementations that you can leverage off, that just saves you a whole lot of work. So um, in Australia, and I realise this is a very Australia-centric example, but in Australia, one of the things that we aim to do is to support industry applications. So we're actually very comfortable with people taking the um, implementation we have of ODC in Australia and then building industry applications, um, IP, that kind of stuff off the back of it. So if there are things you can already leverage off that have already been put in place, I would start there because um, then you save yourself a whole bunch of time, um, but recognize that that's not true, that not the case for everywhere. So, yeah, my, um, my learnings over working this for a few years is that organizing data takes a really long time. Organizing metadata on that data takes a long time. And that if you can find an existing source of data, such as Digital Earth Africa has data over all of Africa, the Element 84 COGS are over the entire world for Sentinel-2. Um, Digital Earth Australia has Sentinel-2 and Landsat for all of Australia. And you can use that directly off S3 without having to store it um, on, on a local server. Um, so leveraging what's already there is getting easier and easier. We just, sorry, Alex, can I just um, confirm that? Is, is all of Digital Earth Australia available through S3? It, it is, so the Sentinel-2 and Landsat uh, analysis-ready data products are all available on S3. Um, if the if Sentinel-2 is getting updated, um, it ought to be finished about now. So yes, and um, things like water observations in space and fractional cover are processed in the cloud in yeah <laughs> as soon as they're available on on s3 and so we have um this is with my my old digital Earth australia hat on we have um, amazon notifications that go ping whenever there's a new ard or derivative product seen and so people like, like rob i um, hope are using those pings to index directly into the data cube um, with very little effort 
No. Yes. No. <laughs> yes. Kind of. Not quite. It's 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 a little not universal around the world. So yeah, there's a few things where it's just like USGS and UN and others, just slightly different flavors. But the, in principle, the answer is yes. So that's pretty exciting. We have two continents where the you know there is good ARD data that can be used to kick off a data queue. Yeah. By anyone. I would say that the Sentinel two data that Element eighty four has organized is um is gold standard in terms of open access like truly open access um uh no requester pays the metadata is fantastic the that they have notifications for new scenes so you can you can do a, a bounding box filter on their amazon service that says that you could find every single new scene that hits tasmania and index that into an open, into the data cube and it will be there within about within a day of being captured i think All right. Well, I think questions are drying up. I'm going to start putting a few links into the chat about where you can find out next steps. So we have a uh, an open forum. It's kind of like a, a, a big room, a thing called Gather Town, where you can join in and chat to uh, folks from the audience as well as some of the panelists from here will be in there. So I, I encourage you to come along there and have a, an informal chat. There's There's only virtual beer, which is unfortunate. Uh, but um, there'll be plenty of uh, conversation, I hope. Uh, uh, quickly, there's a, one more question. Have you developed any standard methodology for the de detection of crops through the Open Data Cube? Adam, do you want to have a go at that one? Um, thanks, Alex. Standard methodology. We are, so Digital Earth Africa is working at how to, building a crop mask using machine learning as the first step to maybe crop types and productivity. Um, but knowing the areas of cropping is a fundamental for many, many purposes, especially in Africa working with food security. Um, so the methodology to say it's standardized, I think what Chad and co have been working on is a, uh, a standardized approach to setting up to do machine learning, to be able to do your own crop masks. Um, but once the crop mask for Africa is done, the, the decision trees, I, I imagine, will be relatively stable and will be a stable, a standardised method. Um, I mean, I say relatively stable mainly because I would hope that we would keep adding more data into that to, produce, to make a more and more accurate approach. For example, we're not currently using the Sentinel-1 data. So I'd hope the method would be standardised but improving. Yep. Um, can I just make a comment there too that not only is the ODC platform itself open source, but a lot of the science that's being done on it is also free and open. So I know Chad's work is sitting on a GitHub repository that anybody can access. Um, Chad started work in Australia, has implemented an Africa-wide crop mask and is now, or will be bringing that work back to Australia. So it, it kind of, it, it allows for the translation of the, the methodologies across the, across the globe because it's using the same underlying data set, which is the Landsat um, ARD archive. Um, but that's true of everything. So the water observations from space is all free and open. The water bodies thing that I was discussing, that's all got its own GitHub repository. So not only do you not have to reinvent the wheel with the actual architecture of the, the underlying database, but actually a lot of the science that sits on top of it is also open source. And if you could find the right person to ask, um, people are happy to share that as well. Thanks, Claire. So we have a um, question from Aurelio, uh, does the Open Data Cube support remote data access protocols? And the um, the answer to that is yes. There is a, a web coverage service, so that you can um, you can hit the Open Data Cube's uh, Open Web Services API and get OGC standard um, API response and, and get data out of it. But I would say that um, the modern paradigm is actually that. Uh, accessing data through, basically through the cloud, offer offer HTTP uh, GET range request is how a cloud optimized geotiff works, or ZAR works the same way. You you select small pieces of a, an object stored on, um, on the web. Um, I think that's the data access protocol, and the complication is what we're trying to look at solving by using a Stack API as an index to those files stored on AWS. That is it's a bit opinionated by me, but um, that's that's my short answer to that one. 
Has anybody else got a take on that one? Nope. So we have another question here, which is what about raster products that you get yourself in TIFF format? Can they be added in that format to the Open Data Cube? And the short answer to that one is yes. Uh, if you have standard metadata, then uh, yes, you can, and it's pretty quick, but you do need to, this is where the learning curve of the Open Data Cube is a, is, is a little bit complicated in that you need to define the, the product, which is, which is what the data looks like. And then you need to provide metadata for each data set. So each TIFF, um, each group of TIFF files that is consistent in terms of date time. So yes, you can add nearly anything to the Open Data Cube, but you do need to do some work around understanding how to index it. Again, this is something that we're hoping to simplify with the Stack API, but if you have a custom data source, you're always gonna to have to build metadata to make it interoperable. Any other questions? Any other closing comments from the panel? Should we maybe do a little bit of a round circle? We might be able to take up this last few minutes. What about you, Caitlin? Closing comments? Um, I'm really grateful to everyone who attended the session today and for all your engaged um, questions. I think it really indicates that we have a passionate community of users who can see the benefit of this tool. And I think that it's great to hear your voices and that we really would love to invite you along to help us um, make this the software that, that you want to use in your, in your varied work across, across the globe. So thank you so much for coming. Um, we really appreciate it. Thanks, Caitlin. What about you, Claire? I guess I just echo what's been said a couple of times is that there's a whole lot of expertise available. And so don't be afraid to reach out to the community if you can't find what you need in the documentation. There's a lot of goodwill. People are, are willing to help and provide what's available. And um, if you spot something that you don't like, chip in and fix it. That's what open source is all about. So thanks. And yeah, and to Claire's point, if you don't know how to fix it, that's okay. Um, you know, even if you can raise an issue on GitHub and the right people can track it down. Um, I would love to see as a community us enabling each other to fix these sort of issues. So even if you raise them and then someone can come along and, and help you make that fix, that's going to enable you to, you know, contribute back in the future. So I definitely agree, Claire, that taking advantage of that expertise, not only to ask questions, but, you know, even if you don't know where to start or what to ask, um, reaching out is the best way. Absolutely, great point, Caitlin. The open open source, open communities need all types of people, not just the people writing the fundamental code, but the people writing the documentation and, and complaining when it doesn't work, <laughs> finding the edge cases. Uh, Sachin? So we strongly believe that uh, Digital Earth Australia and Digital Earth Africa have really built a world-class world -class platform that can enable developing countries to meet their development goals. And this is the reason why we have embarked on the Digital Earth Best Week. And there's a lot of things that we have learned from the two existing projects, and there's a lot of things that there's yet to be learned. And we really hope that we in the Best Week will engage more closely with the other six team going forward in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Adam. Thanks, Alex. Um, I think it's fantastic that we've got 78 participants, a number of panelists. It's great to see that most of them, are those other than myself, are highly qualified and know what they're talking about. Um, so that, but really, it's I want to pick up on. I think Claire and Caitlin made the point that we're seeing a growing community that can help each other, and that's just fantastic. Um, and I hope we're soon going to get to the point where there's there's enough people at all levels of that globally to enable the next data cubes and and to to grow and cases like Digital Earth Africa to prosper, to be able to draw on an, inter an international skills base to continue to go forward. So thank you for having me here this morning. Thanks, Adam. And uh, Rob? I um, just want to reflect briefly. Adam's comments earlier in his presentation were around just the journey from the 
Australian Geoscience Data Cube through to what is now Open Data Cube and the and the various initiatives that are building off of it. And uh, really, I'm I'm like Adam. I'm one of the old school. I've been there since the very beginning. <laughs> Sorry, Adam, but we got to we got to be our age, dude. We're old. <laughs> We're old. And uh, it is fantastic to see that it, in in many respects, just so much more. Um, people involved and engaged and just continuing to build on what was which which was an insane vision when you think about it changes in with ODC working in and the groups like Geoscience Australia and CSIRO working with USGS and others have changed the data supply chain for earth observation making analysis ready data available in the cloud that in turn has enabled Digital Earth Africa, Digital Earth Australia, CSIRO's enterprise deployments, most of which I can't tell you about because they're all commercial in confidence. But um, the, the, this this is astonishing um, and to have been a part of this community, a part of this idea. And it, it is fantastic to see um, a lot more people getting involved, most of which are way younger than I am, um, and uh, really just picking up on that vision. And even so, there's even more growth to be had. Um, so if you're just getting started and you're, you're leveraging off of the open data cube, you can, you're going to hit a, a lot of goals very quickly with the examples. You'll get up and started running with the ARD available. And that opens the opportunity to start looking at things like how do we make the petascale computing far easier to do than it currently is. It's still a challenge and it could be made easier. Um, and that really opens us up there. There's a whole range of activities in machine learning. Um, that start kicking in with Earth observation, particularly if you've got validation data sets starting to kick in. So we're seeing that growth. So I think there's plenty of progress been made, lots to be leveraged, and still uh, a really bright future for the Open Data Cube in this whole area. So, and it's been great to see the community here and be a part of that today. Thank you very much, Rob. Look, with that, I'm going to conclude the um, this session. I want to emphasize that there are there's, there's another broadcast session full of present presenters. We've heard today about people using the Open Data Cube, uh, starting a big initiative like Digital Earth Pacific, or working through the handover of initiative to um, local communities, which is what Digital Earth Africa is aiming to do right now, transition to Africa, um, African ownership. Um, the next session is more focused on the broader Earth observation community. So you'll hear about not just the Open Data Cube, but about other initiatives from all over the world. Um, there's the sprints. So please get involved. If you want to learn more, then Caitlin's leading a training program so that you can get hands on and um, turn what you've heard about today into something which you can touch and feel and do and sort of understand it a bit better. But look, thank you very much. To all the panelists here, Caitlin, Claire, Sachin, Adam, and Rob, really appreciate your time. Thank you for all participating and asking great questions. I'm going to demonstrate now uh, gather so that I can hopefully get you, you folks over into there. There are a few people in here. The idea is that you walk around and find someone like Caitlin over here, and it kicks off the video, and then we can have a chat uh, within this uh, tool. So come along, have a chat. We can be informal. We can swap a bit more notes and ask specific questions that maybe uh, we didn't want to ask in front of everybody. Um, yeah, with that, thank you very much.